If you've ever come across any mention of the word beheading in the last couple years, it was most likely caused by ISIS. This terrorist organization is responsible for some of the worst crimes against humanity in modern times. But have you ever wondered about the man behind it all? How did he become the mastermind of one of the world's most feared extremist groups? Let's dive deep into the life, legacy, and dark ambitions of the leader, credited with the meteoric rise of ISIS, and how it turned into a global threat. Before he became al-Baghdadi, the man was known as Ibrahim Awad Ibrahim al-Badr, born in the ancient city of Samara in 1971. He grew up in a religious household, with his father being a devout follower of the religion of Islam. As a child, Ibrahim was shy and reserved, spending most of his time immersed in religious studies. As he grew up, though, his religious behavior started to take a turn for the worse, and he started strongly reprimanding anyone who strayed from the strictures of Islamic law. One of his neighbors even reported a young Baghdadi furiously breaking up their wedding party because men and women were dancing together. But he didn't suddenly become the brutal terrorist leader who broadcasted brutally on YouTube for the entire world to witness. His radicalization was a slow process that went on for many years. Many pointed fingers at the US invasion of Iraq in 2003 as the catalyst for his radicalization. But dig deeper and you'll find that the seeds of extremism in Baghdadi were sown much earlier. A mix of religious fundamentalism, the iron grip of Saddam Hussein's regime, and Baghdadi's innate desire to dominate, combined to shape the man who would terrorize the globe. Now, while most of Baghdadi's family was deeply religious, yet, interestingly, some of them aligned with the Ba'ath Party, a socialist group pushing for a united Arab nation. While Ba'ath leaders didn't mind personal devotion, they were on guard against active religious movements, seeing them as potential threats. Since the late 1960s, Ba'athism had its hold on Iraq's political landscape. While ties to the Ba'athist party might have been more out of necessity, there's more to Baghdadi's family's ideological landscape. Evidence suggests that many, possibly even his father, were Salafis, a stringent orthodox form of Sunni Islam prominent in places like Saudi Arabia and throughout the Middle East. After graduating from the University of Baghdad in 1996, Baghdadi pursued his passion at Saddam University for Islamic studies, diving deep into Quranic recitation for his master's degree. Given the competitive nature of admissions, it's likely his family's Ba'athist ties played a role in his acceptance. For his masters, Baghdadi delved into a medieval text on Quranic recitation, a project that was meticulous but lacked any form of interpretative challenge, fitting for someone with dogmatic beliefs like Baghdadi himself. Around this period, his uncle, Ismail al-Badri, introduced him to the Muslim Brotherhood, a global movement with a vision of creating states under Islamic law. The Brotherhood was diverse, having both progressive and conservative followers, most of whom worked within political systems to drive change. Many of its members in Baghdad were peaceful Salafis, seeking the imposition of Islamic law, but without the violence. However, Baghdadi was drawn to a subset within them, the jihadist Salafis, who believed in overthrowing leaders they saw as faith's betrayers. Now, this ideology wasn't foreign in his circle. His brother Juma and his mentor Muhammad Hardin, an Afghan war veteran, were of the same belief. Deeply immersing himself in jihadist writings, Baghdadi grew disillusioned with the Muslim Brotherhood, viewing them as all talk and no action. By the turn of the millennium, Baghdadi's urge for action for a battle had only gotten stronger. 
The 2003 US invasion of Iraq was a turning point for a lot of people, including Baghdadi. With Saddam Hussein's regime ousted, Baghdadi plunged into the uprising against both the US forces and the temporary Iraqi leadership. His actions, however, caught up with him in February 2004 when he was detained by the US. But since he was just seen as a civilian who posed minimal threat, he was released by December of the same year. And while rumors swirled in 2014 about further detentions, the Pentagon has confirmed only that one instance. Baghdadi's early involvement with the group known as the Islamic State of Iraq, or ISI, previously referred to as Al-Qaeda in Iraq or AQI till 2006, still remains shrouded in mystery. Why? Well, because Baghdadi was a pretty private person. Even his growth within its ranks isn't all that well documented. Yet by 2010, Baghdadi found himself at its helm, leading one of the most notorious extremist groups in recent history. But how did it happen? In 2006, as resistance against the American occupation gained momentum, Al-Qaeda in Iraq birthed an umbrella consortium for all jihadist factions. Baghdadi's group was among the early adopters. However, Zarqawi, leading the charge, made a bold move by announcing his aspiration to establish an Islamic State. This was a clear deviation from Al-Qaeda's strategy, which was to hold off on any such declaration until the US withdrew and the AQI garnered ample local support. But fate had other plans. Zarqawi's end came with a US airstrike in June of that year. Post Zarqawi, leadership fell into the hands of Abu Ayyub al-Masri, an Egyptian jihadist. Unfazed by the challenges, Masri continued Zarqawi's vision. In October, he declared the birth of the Islamic State, effectively dissolving AQI, with its members now under the Islamic State banner. While Masri held the real power, donning the title of Minister of War, the group's nominal leader, Abu Umar, an Iraqi, started off as a symbolic figure ahead. Baghdadi's academic background in religious studies gave him a unique position within the Islamic State, leading the religious affairs in their claimed Iraqi provinces. Yet, during these early stages, as the group didn't truly hold any substantial territory, Baghdadi's role mainly revolved around ideological enforcement. He ensured that the group's propaganda was consistent with its beliefs and that its soldiers followed its extreme interpretations of Islamic scripture. The consequences of this adherence were brutal. Captured adulterers faced stoning, those caught drinking alcohol underwent whipping, thieves faced the horror of amputation, and anyone deemed an apostate, essentially anyone challenging or defying the Islamic State's agenda, was met with death by execution. By labeling any Muslim who defied him an apostate, Baghdadi weaponized one of the most severe religious condemnations, making it a political tool. Apostasy in many interpretations of Islamic law is punishable by death, and by using this label, he provided a so-called religious justification for the mass execution of opponents. This was not just an act of cruelty, but a strategic move calculated to ensure that fear would deter rebellion. Now, by the time Baghdadi seized control, ISI wasn't doing so well, reduced to a shadow of its former self. But as history has often shown, chaos breeds opportunity, and Baghdadi capitalized on that. The Syrian civil war, which erupted in 2011, destabilized the region, creating voids of power, especially in eastern Syria. This allowed ISI fighters to weave through the porous border moving unrestrained across the lawless tracks of both Iraq and Syria. 
What made Aesai stand out in this tumultuous time was its seasoned fighters and a history of organization, drawing in new Syrian recruits. However, 2013 saw Baghdadi with grand ambitions. He declared a merger between ISI and another potent force in Syria, the Nusra Front, bringing them under his singular vision. He termed this unified entity the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, or ISIL. But not all plans go smoothly. The leadership of the Nusra Front resisted this amalgamation. The rivalry for supporters and dominance led to an outright conflict between these extremist entities. By January 2014, ISIL had managed to push the Nusra Front out of Al-Raqqa, marking the city as its primary base and stronghold. Upon Baghdadi's proclamation as the Caliph, the dynamics of jihadist movements and the Middle East at large went through a significant change. Baghdadi's assertion wasn't merely a symbolic gesture. It represented a direct challenge to the global leadership of Al-Qaeda, essentially declaring ISIL as the new vanguard of global jihadism. This move intensified the already existing schism between ISIL and Al-Qaeda, and jihadist factions across the globe were compelled to pick sides. Under Baghdadi's leadership, the Islamic State showcased unparalleled ambition. The group began to capture and administer territory at an alarming rate, implementing an extreme interpretation of Sharia law in the areas they controlled. These territories weren't just battlegrounds, they were transformed into functioning, yet brutal, administrative regions with ISIL issuing passports, minting currency, and even attempting to run schools and hospitals. This semblance of statehood differentiated the Islamic State from other jihadist factions. One of the most harrowing and internationally consequential acts under Baghdadi's caliphate was the initiation of a gruesome campaign of public beheadings, often broadcasted to the world through social media. These acts were not only meant to instill fear, but also served as a propaganda tool to attract radicalized individuals from around the world. This global recruitment drive was alarmingly effective, with thousands of foreign fighters flocking to Iraq and Syria to join the ranks of ISIL. Baghdadi also oversaw the destruction of invaluable cultural heritage sites, claiming that such monuments promoted idolatry. Regions with rich historical significance, like Palmyra in Syria and Mosul in Iraq, witnessed the decimation of artifacts and architecture that had stood for millennia. In terms of territorial control, under Baghdadi's directive, ISIL managed to seize large swaths of Iraq and Syria. In Iraq, Key cities like Mosul, Tikrit and Fallujah fell under ISIL control. In Syria, Raqqa became the de facto capital of the Islamic State. This rapid expansion posed a direct threat, not only to the stability of Iraq and Syria, but also sent shockwaves throughout the international community, prompting international coalitions to intervene. Baghdadi's reign as caliph marked a period of brutality, rapid territorial expansion, and an alarming resurgence in global jihadism. But Baghdadi didn't just seek territorial conquest. He was on a mission to forge a new social and moral order based on a radical interpretation of Islamic law. The vast territories his group suddenly found itself in charge of gave him the space to do exactly that. Baghdadi's brutal measures, which might seem archaic and extreme to the vast majority of the world's Muslims, were a calculated strategy. 
by imposing these extreme interpretations of Islamic laws and punishments, Baghdadi aimed to project an image of authority rooted in religious legitimacy. He advocated for a return to the original practices of early Islam, which served as a powerful recruitment tool for those disenchanted with modern secular governance and looking for a purer, divinely guided order. Even Al-Qaeda, known globally for its own brutal acts, advocated for a more lenient approach to these punishments, recognizing the potential backlash and global condemnation that could arise from what ISIS was doing. But for Baghdadi, this global outcry seemed to matter little. His primary focus was on cementing his rule locally and ensuring that the population under his domain would be too terrified to rebel. In many ways, Baghdadi's approach mirrored the tactics of secular dictators like Saddam Hussein. Both leaders understood that fear could cement loyalty, that public brutality could deter private rebellion, and that the facade of ideological or religious purity could be used to justify even the most heinous of acts. The grim reality under Baghdadi's rule was that ancient codes, interpreted with unprecedented rigor, were wielded not just as religious guidelines, but as tools of state control and political dominance. At the same time, though, Baghdadi was known for his secretive nature, only making rare public appearances or communications. This not only created an aura of mystery around him, but also provided a strategic advantage, making it difficult for his enemies to track or target him. His absence from the public eye was so pronounced that it gave rise to constant speculations about his well-being, injury, or even death. Despite these rumors and the significant blows ISIS faced with territory losses in Iraq and Syria, Baghdadi remained a symbolic figurehead, a strong symbol of the group's persistence. His brief re-emergence in 2019 through a video was a testament to his continued influence, even as the physical caliphate had crumbled. However, Baghdadi's time was limited. By late October 2019, U.S. intelligence had zeroed in on his location in Syria's Idlib governorate, an unlikely hideout given that the region was not under ISIS's control. As U.S. forces approached rather than be captured, Baghdadi chose to end his life by detonating an explosive vest. Baghdadi's death marked the end of one of the most infamous figures of the 21st century and dealt a significant symbolic blow to ISIL. But of course, the ideas and radicalism Baghdadi propagated lived on as the remnants of ISIS and its ideologies continued to inspire extremist movements globally. That's all for Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the man behind the rise of ISIS. What do you think about Baghdadi's life and rule? Let us know in the comments and make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more. See you next time with something new. Until then, bye.